Yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed. And like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. So with that being said, man, this is going to be a different topic. Came across this article. It's a news article, story. And um, it interests me, man, because like I said, there's bigger and more powerful things on the horizon in places that we don't know about, in places I've never talked about. And like I said, I'm branching out, looking for different topics that are interest you guys like it does me. And I found one for you guys. Trip out on this story. It's going to get detailed. So with that being said, hit that subscribe button. Hit that like. Always leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Check the links in the description for my Apple and Spotify music. Go ahead and run my streams up. And you can check out my playlist section on my YouTube channel and check out my music right there. Thank you guys for you guys' time. Most importantly, thank you guys for you guys' support. Now, this crime took place in Quebec, Canada. Canada? Yes, where Drake resides. Drake's homeland, where it all goes down. Where they have their own mafia and their own syndicates. We got this individual right here, Gregory Woolley. An individual that was connected to the Hells Angels, the Montreal Mafia, and a couple of other syndicates. He was connected to a lot of the organized crime in the underworld that takes place in Canada. While he was just gunned down recently, in broad daylight, in his white Lamborghini expensive white Lamborghini as you can see right here in the picture and what's crazy about this situation is we all know that you know this this crime world this crime enterprise these street gangs these prison gangs you know they're gonna hit you they're gonna hit you wherever they catch you there's a contract on your head which was you know Gregory was advised that they did put a price on the head a hefty price on his head and he was forewarned by law enforcement. He was forewarned by the Hells Angels and biker gangs that he did have a price on his head. And, you know, he chose to ignore it and say, you know what, I'm a powerful, you know, mafia figure in Canada. Well, they gunned down in broad daylight in front of his daughter and in front of his wife. And there was a lot of witnesses that seen it that when it took place. What they did notify, what they did notice was that, uh, and they let the law enforcement up there know was that, it happened with a black vehicle. A black vehicle pulled up on the scene, let off a bunch of rounds, got him, got him slipping, and uh, fled the scene. So they wind up discovering the vehicle, and they're trying to make the connections because it fits the description of the vehicle that took place that committed the crime, but they found it on fire. And this is the picture right here that you see. So, you know, that's pretty much a common practice when it comes to crime. You know, you burn the vehicle, you get rid of the guns, you do this and that to, to get away from, you know, get rid of the fingerprints. So, like I said, it's only connected to the crime, but they haven't really linked it properly. So right now that's under investigation as we speak. Now, this individual is originally from Haiti. And in 1990, he came up in the underworld. He uh, he committed a crime in the beginning, which caught a lot of people's attention. And especially catching the Hells Angels' attention. He was part of a street gang. And him and a, a group of the individuals, their first crime that they ever committed was extortion. They ex tried to extort a bitter divorced man for $100,000. And even to the point that they actually put the pistol to the 12-year-old son of the man that they were trying to extort, put it in his head, threatening him to get him to pay. So he winds up getting charged for that. Goes to prison temporarily. I guess Canada's laws are a little different the way they... Because some of these crimes that I heard about this individual committing... You know, he was doing just very small crimes or unless they didn't have enough evidence and he was taking deals. But some of these charges that he was charged with in California or in the United States, man, that's life sentences, life hella, hella extra life sentences. But still, he goes to prison and he actually creates a massive drug ring from prison cell, orchestrating, orchestrating a lot of big moves on behalf of the syndicates out there, the street gangs and the biker world. But it was sometime during the 90s when he became the leader of the syndicates. And from there, he actually did kind of form a close friendship with the late Hells Angels boss, this guy Maurice. And uh, they got real close. And that's how he was able to establish his presence and his connections with the biker underworld as well. And he was actually one of the first black members to ever become a full-fledged patch member for the Hells Angels. That's when things in his criminal career began to escalate and get a little bit deeper. So like I said, he was charged for that extortion, went to jail, created a drug ring, created some connections. So he came out and he was ready to excel in the underworld. Later on, he was charged for a hot one of a drug dealer. 
that pretty much the Hells Angels wanted taken out the game. For whatever reason, he was charged for that, but he was also acquitted as well. They didn't have enough evidence. They couldn't pinpoint his connection to the Hells Angels, even though he was already a full patch member. And obviously, the, the court system right there couldn't find him guilty, so he was acquitted for that. So obviously, his career, his uprising was starting to look good for him. But it was in 1994 when all this was taking place. There was a big feud out there between the biker world. Now you had the Hells Angels, then you had another MC club that was called Rock Machine. They were going to war, and I'm telling you the the, the history that I read about it. You know the pipe bombs, the bombings, the the drive-bys, obviously the shootings, the the killings that were taking place, the kidnappings. A lot of it was taking a toll on the cities that they were in, that they were beefing with. And it reached a point where the syndicates and the Montreal Mafia wanted to stop all this because it was interrupting business. But by that time, they were willing to stop and try to form this big alliance amongst each other. The Hells Angels pretty much annihilated the Rock Machine MC Club and the rest of the members that were remaining wind up patching over to the Bandidos. Now, the Bandidos in Canada do their own thing. They're, 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 they're under the same banner, but... They don't really have any connections and they kind of feud with the American bandidos. So they're a little bit different. So now everything's at peace. But in 2005, he finally sees some prison time. He was actually charged for a conspiracy to take out another rival gang member of the Hells Angels. And when he went to prison, obviously he was an influential member. Obviously he had a lot of connections from his prior jail time experiences. So he was held in high regard as a political figure, as a mafia figure within the penal system. And in 2007, believe it or not, before his parole date, they had video footage of him and another inmate shanking another inmate. Dude was running all over the tier, running wild, running like a little chicken without his head, but he survived. You know, prison violence does exist in Canada as well. And so they're politicking just like any other prison in the United States. Nothing's different around the world. But this individual would trip me out. Is how he did it. He was able to form an alliance with the Montreal Mafia, the syndicates, the, the biker gangs in Canada, and a lot of these street gangs that were working for the biker gangs and working for the Mafia or working for the, the syndicates. He formed an alliance because his idea and his vision was to create this big underworld where they can all benefit and profit from. Because they had ties to Mexico, they had ties to the British Columbia, they had ties to a lot of drug operations that were bent, that were making a lot of these individuals money. Because the Hells Angels boss, the late one, the one that passed away, obviously he died. Other people took over. A couple of the Montreal Mafia members were indicted and arrested on drug trafficking charges, extradited to the United States. So there was a lot of change in the leadership where he felt like it was his time to show up and do what he had to do on behalf of his syndicate, on behalf of his bike club. I'm not even really too sure where he's connected to because, like I said, he became a full member of the Hells Angels, but he also had ties to the syndicate in which he started from. And then now he was taking care of a lot of business when it comes to the Montreal Mafia. So I don't know if that's like a like a career ladder like that that you can actually climb in. In Canada, I'm not even sure how that works. In 2017, Gregory had a lawyer and his lawyer got indicted on a charge called gangsterism. That was this charge that they that, that found, they found them guilty of. I'm not even sure if that, that's a charge in the United States, but the charge is called gangsterism. Basically, he was charged and accused of utilizing his law office because he was actually a lawyer, a paid lawyer on retainer for the Montreal Mafia and for the Hells Angels bike club. So he was a representative of all these signatures, all this crime enterprise. And um, when he finally gets charged, they figured it out that in his law office, he was utilizing his own law office to, to, to host meetings for the Hells Angels, the Montreal Mafia, the syndicates. Everybody would show up there at his law office since, you know, he, they were all clients. So, you know, the confidentiality privilege agreement that they have that he really can't talk to law enforcement and divulge information to law enforcement, which if you think about it, is a very, very smart move. All these individuals would have these meetings, orchestrate, you know, whatever operations they had going on, the alliances, conduct business, all at the center of his law office. And he got found guilty for it and he was sent to prison. So the guy in the picture that you see right here is an individual that they actually took out. Why? Because while they were forming an alliance with all these street gangs and um, that have the biker clubs and the Montreal Mafia and other syndicates, 
There's another one that I can't pronounce, but it's part of the clan. This individual was the leader of his gang, which had ties to the Bloods. And he actually slapped not only Gregory, but a couple of uh, Montreal Mafia members at a meeting that the Hells Angels were hosting to kind of get everybody in alliance and stop the street bloodshed and the street feuds amongst one another. And um, they didn't like that. Now, why they didn't take him out right then and there, I'm not sure. So he winds up slapping a couple of individuals, high profile mafia figure individuals, thinking he was going to get away with it. But he stood up to these individuals saying that he didn't want to work for nobody, that he wasn't nobody's slave. He wasn't nobody's D sucker. You know what that means. And I'm not talking about lollipops. And um, they wind up gunning him down, too, as well, to make an example out of him and to everybody else that they really wanted everybody in Canada to be under one banner to work in this crime enterprise so everybody can get paid, so there's peace on the streets. Everybody was just trying to come up in this world. Now, the drug operation that was taking place for a lot of years since the 90s is very big. It's very extensive. It's hard to break down. It's a lot to break down. But I could just say this. This individual right here is named Cosmo. He was part of the Montreal Mafia. He got busted off getting off a plane from Cancun. He was headed to Canada, but they stopped him in Houston and they busted him and they arrested him on conspiracy charges for creating one of the biggest drug networks from Canada, Mexico, and the United States and trafficking cocaine. So he winds up getting busted. But Gregory at the time is still out and he's still working with the Hells Angels. He's still working with the Montreal Mafia. And he's still trying to get everything together and have everybody still in alliance. But around this time, in some way, in some fashion, the Italian Mafia, La Costa Nostra, the Banano family, there was a lot of hits going on with the, the acting boss and his son that were taken out. There was a lot of plots to take out other biker leaders. So there was a lot of people trying to just take each other out and try to gain all the control of this criminal enterprise that was going on. So not everybody's feuding. And this dude, Gregory, was one of the ones at the top that was keeping everything orchestrated, keeping everything going, was probably going to be the next mafia boss, if you ask me, the way it was sounding. But guess what? All these plots and schemes to take out, you know, biker leaders in prison and on the streets and La Costa Nostra getting involved because the Italian mafia wants to take over Canada now, basically the Gambino and the Bonanno family. And just recently, somehow, some way, this individual made a lot of enemies and they gunned him down in broad daylight in his Lamborghini. This is a picture right here of the Montreal mafia leader who just recently got indicted on a lot of charges and he's being extradited to the United States as we speak. So now the Montreal Mafia obviously is gonna have a little power struggle. Obviously somebody's gonna be trying to climb the ladder and take over the position of the Montreal Mafia. And with Gregory now gone, a lot of crime experts and a lot of people in uh, law enforcement when it comes to Canada are basically saying they took out one of the one dudes that was keeping the peace. This individual was keeping everybody in the lines, keeping everybody together, keeping everybody in their place, and everybody was making money under this man. And now that he's gone, that Canada is going to see one big violent bloody war because everybody's fighting for the top prize. Everybody's fighting for control over Canada. Now, I read this story, and uh, like I said, it blew my mind. So I wanted to share it with you guys. You know, the United States does have its, you know, his gang culture. It's criminal enterprise, it's criminal underworld when it comes to the mob, the Italian mafia, these prison gangs, these prison leaders. Every state's different. So crime does exist, crime does go on in the world. We also know what goes on across the border in Mexico when it comes to the cartels. Those are going to be subjects that I want to talk about very, very soon to broaden my horizon. Never thought I'd read an article about Canada, even though I know things take place in Canada. But this story right here was just intriguing. There's a big bloody war in efforts to take over the country of Canada. So I'm glad I was able to share that story with you guys. Just another true crime story that's taking place as we speak. And thank you guys for you guys' time for checking out my video, man. I really do appreciate it. So with that being said, like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.